come to represent in so many different things is really kind of this place where Atlanta draws a great deal of capital off of its identity based upon what took place on that on that street where on that area and if you start from the residential area moving all the way down to the commercial area which is now separated by the highway you really get to also see this larger story of the 20th century of the economic uh, will, transition the rise the fall the complexity uh, post-civil rights, uh, the rise of Atlanta as being this remarkable space where Mayor Jackson became the first mayor of a major um, American city, the first African American to do so. And then how this space has been kind of where everyone goes to draw from. But now we find ourselves in a situation where it's now time to reinvest in it. You know, we have certainly taken from it a great deal, but it we need to be giving to it in equal fervor. And what one of the reasons that I, we contacted was in regards to the building located at 229 Auburn Avenue, which really is this remarkable, significant, and this metaphor for so much. In that building, between that that space, that corner, has been in the possession of black people since the 1870s. So if you kind of wrap your head around, and I know when we look at the pantheon of the world, 1870 to 2023 doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but in our country, and particularly in the city of Atlanta, when you think about the American Civil War, the burning of Atlanta, all these various things, 1870 is still very much in its infancy. And when you think about this space being in that kind of um, unique, if you will, just kind of bubble, it's pretty fascinating. You take from 229, also there the Walden Building and the Butler Street YMCA, what is now Jesse Hill was once Butler Street. But the fact that the Butler Street YMCA is the first YMCA that was built for black people in the country, designed by Neil Reed. You have a lot of different things. That little building, 229, started out as a grocer. And between 1910 and 1913, was the first bank for black people in the entire state of Georgia. Across the street from that is Gate City Drugs, which is the first drugstore. The tiles that are out there on the street are the, the remnants of what remains on that side of the Oddfellows building of the first uh, drugstore, or chemist, if you will, uh, for black people in the state of Georgia. There's a lot of things happening. And we have these particularly unique artifacts of that experience through these buildings, through these spaces, and through these structures. And Auburn Avenue is really um, a rich catalog of this. And even with urban renewal, challenge, people's perceptions of what a community is based upon economics and all these various things, it doesn't change what it is. And I think so often that is the conversation that is absent. And in a city that is so um, comfortable with real estate being this kind of uh, permission to do a number of different things, that cultural narrative is sometimes either buried or lost in some of these transactions and the relational component, the things that we see ourselves as people from Atlanta, who, who live in Atlanta, that relational component becomes, um, if you will, suppressed by the idea of the sense of what we can and can't do. This idea of if you sort of have economic freedom because Atlanta represents so many different things in that, that platform that it's difficult to kind of govern it. Auburn Avenue, since the late 70s, has lost almost 47%, 47% of its original fabric. So we are now in a situation where if we continue to lose the historic fabric, continue to lose these buildings, we're going to arguably lose our national register uh, uh, nomination. We're going to lose the, capa the capacity to have federal involvement to support these things, to grants and so forth. There's a number of things that happen. And at a certain level, what's also transitioning, which is uncomfortable for a lot of people, is the fact that Auburn Avenue inherently becomes anyone who claims to say Atlanta is their home and Auburn Avenue is their responsibility in some way or another. And you, this is, this is now broaching the conversation and piercing the veil of this is no longer a black or white narrative. This is an Atlanta 
decision. It's our duty as citizens of the city to protect the space, to preserve the space, and to promote its history, all of it, and the complexity of it, and the richness of it, and what people achieve there. And so 229 really captures, in so many ways, that thing. Because when you look at the fact that men and women coming out of very complicated backgrounds, utilizing the space, being the springboard, Heman Perry, these, 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 these lions, uh, Alonzo Herndon, these people who really came forward. This thing. We have a Madam J. Walker beauty salon up the street. I mean, when you start looking at the African-American richness in this space and what Atlanta has to draw upon, old Ebenezer, these things, it's something pretty fascinating. But for me, the commercial district is obviously um, in great challenge and supporting it and making sure that people identify it and understand that those, that those bricks are not simply an old building. Those bricks represent individuals who persevered and endured to provide us the securities and the luxuries we have today to be able to say we live in such a great city like Atlanta. And it is a duty of this organization and everyone in the city to make sure that building is there long after we're all gone. It's kind of like the, 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 in a certain way, you know, the, the, uh, the dream that won't die. That building, that corner lot building existed. When Herndon took possession of that property and started to build there, he enveloped that building. And so, in, it, it, if you will, it became consumed by the Atlanta Life Insurance building. When the tornado came through in 08 and took out the Herndon building, it then, if you will, revealed um, this original corner building which was again absorbed into it. So all of a sudden, it's a kind of a great way in a, in a tragedy of losing one building, we rediscover a piece of another part of the story. And of course you have the gold dust twins on one side of this, which is a, you know, a complicated component of the history, which are all, you know, with all the, but again, it shows the layers, the complexity, and it really all of a sudden gives that, this building that many people would look at and think is dormant. It gives it much more, it's breathing. The fact that you have these components of the old Hernan building that are still holding the building up and doing certain things, all of these visual metaphors that say we will, we shall, and we can are encapsulated in that space. And I, so I'm, to say 229 Auburn Avenue is a big deal against is huge. You take that, you spread out on Auburn Avenue. You go up to Prince Mason, where you have the Majesty of Walker. You go down where you further, where you have Constellations building, which Gene Kansas has done. And also you have the Herner buildings, which are owned by HDC. These things, they're all these uh, very complex ways of speaking because everyone wants to do arguably the right thing. Everyone wants to be a steward of their space. But there's also, too, on Auburn Avenue, all the wonderful things are equally to all these very complicated things kind of pushed in Atlanta and made to encapsulate this one space. That's where King's funeral went down. I mean, it's kind of, you just have all this stuff that's just like, you know, what else can you add here? And you just keep uncovering and you find more things, you do more things. Again, going to the Gate City Drugs, where you see this is the first pharmacy for black people. All these things that keep happening, the Odd Fellows building and its importance and its significance. All these commercial, but there's just so much buzz on that space but because of again I and I kind of echo back to the real estate component of, of Atlanta's behavior those things are looked at and they try to put these things in boxes because when you can put it in a box you can just explain it or you can do it and so then I will use the word legal broadly but legal then becomes it has this it doesn't have this it has this justification or that just case culture and identity don't fit in to that kind of description but the word that is really ultimately absent in this is love. And I think people need to fall in love with their city. They need to fall in love with the culture of their city. They need to fall in love with what their city represents and really start to understand that. Atlanta represents something unparalleled in this entire country. Atlanta is to me a cosmopolitan city with what's happening in the downtown area of Newport and what they're doing on Mitchell Row, all these things. This city has every, every opportunity. The city has every single thing, and Auburn Avenue personifies so much of that. Predominantly positive and cautious. People want to do the right thing. People are intrinsically trying to do the right thing for the most part, particularly when they have become either the um, owners of these properties through whatever process, 
or they have taken by choice the um, leadership of these properties. So I, I have to, I have to, and I choose to believe that people are wanting to do and try and do the right thing. But the levers and mechanisms that exist um, to do the right thing sometimes are difficult to read, understand, and use. And what happens then is someone says, I want to do this, this, and this. I want to go through this process. Well, they either go down this path and have something happen that gives them a negative experience. And it's like anything else. If you have a bad experience and you've already taken stuff, you're economically paying taxes, you're doing these things to preserve this stuff. It starts to get, it, the, the emotions come in. And once people become kind of emotionally charged, it's much more difficult to kind of diffuse that and become, I'll use the word rational, you know, again, in a, in a big term. But I, I feel that there is a groundswell more and more and more, particularly from the people who have lived in Atlanta for multiple years and or are born here. But, you know, we always talk about the fact that natives are so difficult in Atlanta and because of the transit component, whatever it is, you know, at some point in time, you know, when you swear an allegiance to anything or you, you say you love someone or you say you don't really think about all the various things. If you fall in love, you don't think about, well, does this person like this kind of food or not? You fell in love with this individual for who and what they are and you embrace them and you accept them for that. This city is the same way. And I think that um, for the, the bulk of these people truly, truly, truly want to do the right thing and sincerely, but due to the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, and the challenge of pre-Olympics, post-Olympics, people's experiences in that have really fostered that. And, and I would say that Albert Avenue was um, not embraced and treated fairly in the Olympic process. It was really quickly made to appear nice, but it wasn't a sustainable nice. It was good for the period of time that it lasted, for the duration of the experience, but it didn't create a process forward to promote its preservation, to promote its inclusion. It was really kind of, let's look good for this period and then we'll go from there. And, and I can say I'm justified in that statement if you look at the fact that we've lost 47% of the historic fabric that exists there since 1977. So I feel comfortable. In it. I, think, I think what it already is, the cult, a cultural epicenter for the city. I think that what's going to happen is you're going to demystify people's experiences. They're going to start to understand that what accomplishments occurred on Atlanta are our accomplishments, not theirs or those, but ours. And you're going to see more and more school children going and seeing this and treating this like we traditionally have gone to Washington, D.C. and gone to see these very particular spaces as an idea of as a rite of passage to the American uh, diaspora in Atlanta. You're going to see more and more. I'm going to walk up and down Auburn Avenue and I'm going to see where these things happen. And that then becomes part of the lexicon. So I think in, in a certain way, I think the sun is in our face, not on our backs in this conversation. And, you know, it, this is not some sort of uh, overwhelmingly optimistic or positive simply just to say something good. I think that the culture is there. I think that Auburn Avenue has the initiative and the desire and the wherewithal to do it, both from its residents and from the political dynamics. We have a council member now who has shown much more vigor and to want to support this and doing it. The thing about it is, is that I, what may be the most fascinating thing in all this is so often we look to the youth with trepidation and fear rather than with hope and promise. And I do believe that the crowd coming up, particularly those that are willing to have the courage to take responsibility for this, are going to surprise us in many ways, and Auburn Avenue will be the visual response of that.